because we're birders, of course, to see birds. Uh, this is a map of Iceland and it shows our trip. We took a Colette trip. Um, the trip was called Land of Fire and Ice. And of course, Iceland is called that land because of the volcanoes and the many glaciers. We went at the end of July and into early August. We flew out of Newark, New Jersey. So it was about a five hour overnight flight to Iceland. Uh, we wanna show you the golden circle. Uh, we landed in Reykjavik and then we did the first day um, of our tour was the golden circle. Show the cursor. Uh, many people who go to Iceland uh, do this golden circle. And then we went up to the Snæfellsjökull Peninsula. And pardon me, I don't speak Icelandic, so I'm probably mispronouncing the names. Uh, we did a little cruise here. Uh, then we went back down through the country to this waterfall, to Vik, and then the Glacial Lagoon before we went back to uh, Reykjavik. So basically that was our trip. Next slide. And for those who don't know who we are, here is the uh, happy uh, top, uh, couple uh, standing in uh, one of the areas of Iceland. We look much younger now. <laughs> Some facts that we learned about Iceland uh, on our trip. Uh, there were a few Irish monks that were there before the Norsemen, but they didn't stay. So the first recorded um, settlers were led by Ingolfur Arnonson in 1874. Uh, they came over in their boats from Norway. He threw a couple of um, carved posts into the sea. And he said to his people that were with him, we will set up our farm wherever the posts land. And the posts landed in the uh, Bay of Reykjavik and the name of Reykjavik means steam or smoke bay. And you can actually see the steam from the Blue Lagoon when you're riding in from the airport. And interestingly, the airport was built by Americans during World War II, and it's quite a distance from the city. It's a good 45 to 50 minutes uh, into the center of the city from the airport. Uh, Iceland became a republic uh, in June of 1944. They had been under the authority of Denmark. Our guide told us the uh, Danish people did not treat the Icelanders very well. So they were happy to uh, declare their independence. Their uh, language, Icelandic, is a form of Old Norse. Uh, their currency is the Icelandic krona versus the Norwegian krona. Their religion, the main one, is the Evangelical Lutheran Church. They're the least populated country in Europe and Iceland is about the size of Kentucky. Those are just some basic facts. Okay, so we go to downtown uh, Iceland, um, to Reykjavik rather. Um, uh, this is our hotel, the Plaza Center Hotel. Very nice location near a lot of things. Across the street was a, a very bright colored building and uh, we went in there to eat pizza several times. And there's a sign in front of the building that says, come in, the worst pizza in Iceland. Apparently one of the uh, people that ate in there said it was awful pizza. And so they put it on their sign and it's actually very good pizza. So that was really rather humorous. <laughs> we like cats. So uh, this was a ladies department store and uh, we had to take a picture because we're cat people. And because we're cat people, when we were in one of the grocery stores, they have Purina Friskies. And if you know Icelandic, at the bottom of the bag, uh, it talks about the Friskies in Icelandic, but on the right-hand side, upper side of the bag, you'll notice it says in English, no art added artificial colorants. So that was kind of interesting. Uh, Iceland has a very famous hot dog stand, kind of like the Icelandic Nathan's, uh, the hot dogs are lamb and uh, spices. We never got to eat one because it was always very busy. <clears throat> the uh, signs in Iceland are quite interesting. Again, we don't speak Old Norse, so uh, we won't even pretend to pronounce them. Uh, we were there in late July, early August, as I said, it was kind of overcast, but uh, we still, 
thankfully didn't have rain yet and we could go out and take walks around the area of the hotel. We did uh, pre-book a uh, day on our own. So this is the first day and there were some very beautiful flowers as you can see. This is the uh, government house, um, which was right near where we were staying. And they had a very interesting metal plaque with the ox, the griffin, the uh, dragon and the Norseman. That was quite uh, artistic. And the government house had been used for many different things. It served as a prison. It served as a royal residence, the governor's residence, and also government offices. So being birders, one of the first things we did, this is on our own, we decided to take a puffin tour. And here we are with our friends, uh, Dave and Sandy Davis in the office, um, getting our insulated suits on. And of course, you wear an insulated suit in case, God forbid, you walk in, um, you, you, you fall into the water. The water is obviously quite cold. Uh, this is the uh, kind of boat that we went out on. And there we are in our suits on the boat. And you notice we have goggles. Uh, it did start raining while we were on our puffin tour. And uh, we, good thing we had goggles because you couldn't see a darn thing for a while. And of course, thank God, we got to see the puffins. Uh, these are Atlantic puffins. They come into a land, uh, both in Iceland, Scotland, and Maine to breed in the summertime. And then they spend the rest of the year out to sea. This is called Harpa. It's the um, concert hall made of glass. And you'll see some other pictures, a very modernistic building. And there I am with my little Viking friend, uh, this is a little statue by the grocery store, which was next to our hotel. Notice my attire of hiking shoes, jeans, a couple of different layers on the top. Uh, we didn't have to dress up on this tour because most of the time we were spending um, our time outside uh, looking at the various waterfalls and other sites. This is the statue of Inger Four Honorson who was the first settler. So this is a statue in one of the squares. And this is the foundation of one of the first Norse settlement houses. And they were kind of like Iroquois long houses. They were very long. And uh, these happened to be either circular or rectangular. And on the back wall, you see um, this kind of white panel. Uh, those were glass panels and within the panels, they had dioramas of um, what the Norse life was like with the early settlers. Very nice museum. Uh, here we are um, gathered together with our guide. She's gonna give us a uh, city walking tour. And I mentioned it was a Colette tour. Here's our bus. They couldn't park in front of the hotel because of the narrow streets. This is the city hall, the uh, fountain in front of city hall which again was near where we um, stayed in our hotel. And a very interesting uh, topographical map of the island showing the volcanoes and the glaciers. So we went to see that map a couple of times because it was quite interesting. <clears throat> this is another view of one of the squares and our guides giving us a little bit of history. Now, this is the beginning of the shopping street. Every city has to have a shopping area, obviously. So this metal tulip was an indicator that you are now over in the shopping area. And at the top of the hill on the shopping street is the a tower of the famous church. We did not get up the hill closer to the church. Uh, we were tired. <laughs> we were recovering from jet lag and it's a very steep hill. So we said, we'll do that another day. Uh, of course, puffins are a big thing in Iceland. So there I am with my uh, friendly puffin on the street, a little too big to put in the suitcase. Uh, this is a sculpture of a cellist and it's in front of the uh, Harpa concert hall. And again, you can see it's a very modernistic uh, building. Here's another view of it. Uh, being birders, 
uh, we were interested in the Arctic tern and it's in breeding plumage with the red beak. Uh, another very beautiful um, thing to see in Reykjavik is this sculpture called the Sun Voyager. And although people think it looks like a Viking ship, it is not actually meant to be a Viking ship. It is meant to be a dream boat and an ode to the sun. There was the sign. <clears throat> okay, this is a little church that we went into as part of our tour. And you'll notice the uh, insides are very plain compared to churches you see in Italy and France. One of the more interesting uh, statues was the faceless bureaucrat. And I worked for New York state government for many years. So I kind of appreciated the faceless bureaucrat. And there's Noah, and you can see there was an outside cafe uh, in this area. This is around city hall. Again, a nice little area to walk around. And again, uh, we had some nice sunshine that day. In addition um, to our city tour, we went on our own when we had free time to the Volcano House, which had an excellent film about the volcanoes in Iceland. And the film showed some of the houses that were destroyed by different volcanoes. Uh, very, very nice uh, little museum and film. And this is a, a little colorful post office box. Now we're on our way to uh, the Golden Circle. This is um, some of the landscape from the bus. Um, so some of them aren't as clear as pictures as others because they're from through the window from the buses. Uh, a lot of Icelanders have horses as pets. Uh, horses are a big favorite of them to uh, maintain and to keep. Okay, we're now at Thingvellir National Park. This is the sign at the visitor center. Uh, Thingvellir is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, it's where the, um, in 1930, Iceland had its first parliament, the All Thing was formed here and a lot of laws were passed here in this park over the years. One of the main things about this park, it's at the junction of two tectonic plates on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, the North American plate and the um, Eurasian plate. So the scenery is very dramatic and Iceland's growing at about five centimeters, five centimeters per year because of the spreading of the plates. Here we are on the top platform before we walk down through the ridge, um, <clears throat> looking at the, it's an overview. Uh, one of the first things we see, of course, there's many uh, different lava formations, but here is some rope lava. This is a picture of, from the platform of the landscape with the water, the little hotel, a church, very, very beautiful area, absolutely gorgeous. Okay, now we're gonna walk down through the huge fissure, which is the Mid-Atlantic Rift. And you can see there's a lot of people. That's not our guide holding up the sign, that's some other group. <clears throat> and there's the sign about fissures and fissures opening up. And there's another example of smaller fissures. They're all over the landscape. And there again, we're, um, as we walk down through the rift, um, there's places to uh, go out onto platforms, and this is the Thingvellir Lake, the biggest lake in Iceland. And there were some gorgeous flowers growing through the lava. A good picture of the Icelandic flag. You can see it was a little windy. And another scene of people going down through the rift, and you can see people all the way down to the very end. It was very crowded that day. And this shows you how high the walls of the rift are as we walk down through that area. And then we're here at the bottom, um, looking back up from where we just walked down. Fabulous, fabulous area. I would recommend anybody goes to Iceland, you, you should go to that park. Now we're at the geyser area, which is part of the um, Golden Circle. And it's very similar to Yellowstone National Park with the hot springs, the mud pots, and a geyser. That's a, one of the hot springs. And then that's the uh, walkway to the geyser. You can see the steam rising from the geyser there. And the geyser was named Stroker. 
And there's Stroker starting up. And there's Stroker getting higher. And, and there's Noah getting soaking wet. And Noah, <laughs> they warned us, don't watch where you stand because you can get wet. And he did. Measure the wind direction before you do this. And Stroker uh, explodes to uh, frequently and it goes up to a height of about 90 feet. And it's circular, so you can walk pretty much around the whole geyser. And I liked it better than the old faithful at Yellowstone because it explodes frequently and you can get really, really close. Very, very interesting. Then we moved on, still in the golden circle, to Gull Foss. Gull means golden, Foss is waterfall in Norwegian. So we're on to the Golden Falls. And this is a map. You can go to an upper platform <clears throat> and then you can walk back down and go to a lower platform. This is a, a double uh, cascade fall and it's about a hundred feet in height. And here's my friend uh, Sandy and I standing there, the wind's blowing and uh, we were getting a little wet from the mist. The mist from the falls was actually blowing up that high. You can see the uh, specks of water on the left-hand side here on the camera. Just wait. And then we're up at the top looking down at the big rock, which we'll go to later, uh, which is um, you get a little closer to the first cascade of the falls. And there's a good view of the river coming down and the double cascades. And up to the left, you can see where we were up here. And then you can see the people walking down now to the big rock, which is something we'll show you in a minute. And there's another view of the path to the big rock. And you can see how much mist is uh, coming up from the falls on the people on the rock. And uh, the water is extremely powerful. Very scary. If you fell in there, you'd be a goner. <laughs> uh, this is a view of the lower cascade with the water going into the gorge. And this is a picture of the woman whose family owned the land of, around the falls. I can't pronounce her name. Um, but she would walk into Reykjavik, which is not close by to talk to the government people about preserving this land as a park. An Englishman wanted to put a hydroelectric plant in here and she fought that. And thank God uh, she was able to convince the government to preserve it as a park. And this is a view of the lower falls into the gorge. And then this is when we are starting back up the hill um, to go back to the parking yeah, lot. Yeah, the parking lot is right up here. It's a very easy walk, but it's a spectacular view. Okay, the oh, last... Just, just one more thing. All of this water is glacier fed, if you're wondering where all the water came from. The last stop on the Golden Circle is at the Friedheimer Farm, which uh, they raise tomatoes and they raise horses. And they gave us a display of the horses. The Icelandic horses are the same breed that the Norse brought over back in 1874, whatever that date was. Um, they have not interbred them with any other horses. They're considered purebred from whatever the breed was that was originally brought over. They're gorgeous horses. They're smaller than some of our horses, maybe a little stockier. But the interesting thing about these horses, they have five different gates, G-A-I-T, whereas most horses only have three gates. Only the Icelandic horses, we were told, have five gates. And there they are coming around the, the ring. And then she demonstrated she could hold a uh, mug of beer and not spill any as they come around the ring. And then it was nice. We could go into the barn and see the horses up close. Okay, we said part of the um, farm, they grew tomatoes. So they grew tomatoes in the greenhouse. There's a little railroad track. Uh, you could eat tomato soup, which we had lunch there, tomato soup and some very nice crusty bread. And that was just interesting, all the pipes and valves, because they've got to maintain the temperature and the water and the humidity and all that good stuff. All the heat is from uh, the geothermal. There's the outside of the greenhouse. It's 
quite it's extensive. Huge. It's huge. Okay, then we're on our way to our next stop and um, we're passing the power plants. And as Noah said, the, elect the electricity is produced by GMO, geo, GMO, yeah, geothermal power. Uh, there's another uh, sign in Icelandic. Sherry, do you know how to say that? Ring lummi rarabur. Okay. Forget it. <laughs> uh, again, another picture of the landscape just to show you. Um, it's kind of barren. There are a few trees here and there. Of course, the Vikings cut down a lot of the trees. Uh, you'll notice on the left hand side of your screen, the zigzag pipes. These are the pipes carrying the uh, hot steam and they're zigzag because of the many earthquakes. That way the pipes won't break and uh, you'll have a big repair job. As we went along to our next stop, we would see these isolated farmhouses kind of reminded us of Scotland, the highlands of Scotland with their little isolated farmhouses. Nice little church. And then we're coming up to a lava field and you can see the lava is very rugged, very jagged. You don't wanna fall on it. You could really uh, hurt yourself. And of course, being a volcanic area, island, there's a lot of basalt columns. And so here's a basalt column wall. It's part of the landscape. Many waterfalls in Iceland. They did have a few cows. Mostly we saw sheep, but there were a few cows on this particular farm. And they had a beautiful waterfall behind their farmhouse and buildings. And it is quite an extensive waterfall. And then you can see the bales of hay and a close up of another smaller waterfall. We're gonna see some huge waterfalls later on. This was our first sighting of a glacier. Again, we were lucky it was a sunny day. This map shows the, gla the glacier, of course. <clears throat> and I won't pronounce it. I don't wanna murder the Icelandic. Um, here were our two guides. We were gonna walk on a lava field and we had to have walking sticks because as I said, it's very rough, very uneven and very jagged. And these people are coming down a path. We will be coming down that path. And then notice this guy up here looking through the, the big rock. Mary Helen had to go look through the big rock. So you'll notice I've got my walking uh, stick and um, I'm on my hikers and believe me, it was not easy to get up over that jagged rough lava to up to that spot, but it was worth it. When I looked through, I saw the fissure and the uh, part of the uh, glacier. Unfortunately, a cloud came along just then. Noah's gonna talk about these stones. Yeah, the, the uh, first of all, this is a very rocky beach and the, the story was what we were told by the guides is that if you look at the rocks, there are varying sizes from small, medium to large. And when people decided they wanted to be a member of a crew to get their position on the boat, they had to pick up these rocks and your position on the crew based upon which rocks you can pick up. So if you picked up the small rock, you had a lesser position. If you picked up the big rock, I think you were probably captain. Uh, it was just an amazing thing. Uh, we tried not to pick any of them up. Okay, we're now on this particular beach um, and you'll notice there's pebbles and the rocks get bigger, of course, as you get closer to the shore, um, but it really wasn't a black sand beach. This was a, more of a um, black pebble beach, um, but the pebbles are smooth from the action of the sea. Okay, we're on the bus. We didn't happen to stop at this crater on our tour, but you notice people can go to the crater and walk up and look into the crater. And I think that would have been um, a lot of fun if we'd had that on our tour. <clears throat> Another one of the multi-tiered waterfalls. We stopped for lunch and this was kind of an interesting landform. Uh, I'm sure there's a term for it in geology, but I don't recall right now. Uh, then this was one of the reasons we took this particular uh, tour. <clears throat> they had a cruise, a private cruise, 
to go out and see the bird life. And being birders, of course, we wanted to take that. And here's the puffin, and the puffin's in breeding plumage. And you know that because their bill is much brighter in the summer than it is in the winter. And puffins have kind of a stocky little body, so it takes them a while to um, get lift off from the water. Yeah, they run on the water before they can actually take off. And some of the birds we saw uh, were the black legged kittiwakes, which are a type of gull. And you can see they're putting their nest on these rather narrow ledges. Yeah. And this is a juvenile kitty wake, which we can tell by his black collar. And there's a mama kitty wake, uh, barely <laughs> on the nest, which is barely on the ledge. And these are tilted basalt columns. And this is a skag, S-H-A-G, which is like our cormorants here in Sun City. And these are the four juveniles. Again, we were amazed they were standing on this little ledge not falling off. Looking down into the water, of course, we see some things and there were the jellyfish. And this is just a scene looking out from the boat. And part of our cruise included dragging the sea bottom to bring up scallops and sea urchins. So we got to taste the fresh scallops. Oh, they had a few other critters, of course, in there, the, uh, the starfish and the uh, crabs. Uh, so we got to taste the scallops, yes, which were delicious, but rather salty. And then the sea urchin roe, which yes. was fine. And then a close up. And you'll notice all the horizontal striations, I think you call them, in these basalt columns. I'm pointing them out for a reason. So, and then, of course, we have to show you more puffins because the puffins, thank God, are everywhere. And this puffin takes off. It was a great shot to get the puffin in flight. Now we're off to sh the shark museum and this was a little creepy. Here's the lava covered with this thick, deep uh, green moss, kind of looked like green slime. So that was just a little bit creepy <laughs> going through that area. And here's the sign to the shark museum. And you've probably heard about the preserved cured shark in Iceland. It's an Icelandic delicacy. We do not recommend this. And there's the, and they preserve Greenland sharks. And here's the jaw of a shark. And then here's the cured, if you're ever wondering about it, the cured shark meat. And our friend Dave was brave enough to try a piece. The first piece he said wasn't too bad. The second piece he said was awful. So Noah and I were smart enough not to try the cured shark nope. meat. And we just took a picture of this. Uh, I think it's a rooster because it was pretty in the uh, flowers in the meadow. It's a bird. It's part of the farm. Okay, now we're at the Foss Hotel uh, on our trip on to our next area. And Foss, again, means waterfall. So we're going to a waterfall. Yeah, the accommodations were very good. And this was a church, a modernistic church across the street from our hotel. Okay, we're on our way to visit the uh, geothermal plant. There's the uh, logo. We're in the plant. This is the largest geothermal thermal plant in Iceland. And this was a map. <clears throat> and the pink dots are the high temperature areas. And then the blue dots are the low temperature areas. And the yellow is the major hot spot. And where all these dots are, they have geothermal facilities above both the low temperature and the high temperature dots. So you can see they have geo geothermal, I can't say that today, all over Iceland. Yeah, all their buildings are heated by this. It's amazing. And that's a schematic of the pipes going down into the earth, uh, bringing up the hot water and the steam. And this is an outside look at the plant with its many pipes, the pipes up the hill. And then again, the zigzag pipes because of the earthquakes. Now we're on to one of the uh, first waterfalls. Again, I can't pronounce the name of this waterfall, so I'll skip it. But you can walk behind this waterfall, which Noah did. It's kind of slippery. You have to have good shoes and some rain gear. And there's the view from behind the waterfall. 
Now we've gone on to Vic, and this is a little bridge over some water outside our lodging, which was just outside of the town of Vic. And the bridge took us to this road and to this glacial outwash plain. And um, the, the uh, lodging was outside of Vic. So in a way we were lucky because we got to see um, some interesting bird life and um, other things by being outside of the town. And for the birders, here's a red-throated loon, which we were thrilled to see. Uh, they have several ponds on the property. This was a, a loon on the pond. And these are whooper swans. And then this is a formation that we saw from the bus as we go to our black volcanic beach. Now, <clears throat> there's a warning sign when you get to the beach. And this was very interesting to us. Um, they have things called sneaker waves, which are much larger than you can see the sign that says the ordinary wave. And people have actually been washed off the beach, kind of like the North Beach of Hawaii. Um, people have been washed off the beach and a few tourists have died. So that may just sit up and take notice. Okay, here's our approach to the big cave and the basalt columns. And again, you can see the formations out in the sea, which are lava, and you can see the basalt columns over to the right, or the left, rather. And um, there's Noah. Now you notice these basalt columns have got some cracks and some holes in them, but they look different from the ones we saw on our cruise. Yeah, they don't have the striations. And for the birders, this is a skua, S-K-U-A, which is a large seabird. Uh, it steals food from other seabirds, like other gulls, and it comes in to breed on land in the summer and then spends the rest of the year out at sea. And there's uh, Dave and I <clears throat> under part of the cave, and you can see these basalt columns, which were straight where Noah was standing, are now slanted and tilted. And then you can see me in the cave, and you can see how large it is, and you can see how the columns are tilted in many different ways. It was just totally fascinating that these, uh, the bottom of the uh, basalt columns um, were at all sorts of different angles. Fascinating place. And this is a good view from inside the cave out to sea. And we were lucky the day we were there, there were no sneaker waves. Uh, the tide was out, the sea was calm. You could actually get close to the, uh, the sea. And of course, what did we see in the, the sea? More puffins. Now this is a peninsula and we got to go out on that peninsula. You can see a large opening in the rock. Quite beautiful. And this was called the Black Sand Beach. And again, our sneaker wave sign. And now we're up very high. We're not down on the sand, but up very high. And it was just a fabulous, fabulous view. And this is indeed black volcanic sand. And over again to the right, you can see where we were with this other formation. So we were here and now we're over on the uh, peninsula. And this is a good slide to show you that uh, puffins burrow into the hillside and lay their eggs in a burrow. And then they, you know, go in and out as need be um, to hatch their eggs and feed their young. And again, Noah got one flying. Now we're on our way to our next uh, waterfall, I believe, past the glacier. And this is the uh, Skogafoss waterfall. And it's one of the largest in Iceland. And I love this waterfall. Um, it's hanging off the hanging valley, uh, <clears throat> coming down very powerful, very wide. But the best thing about this waterfall is you can walk up to the top up these stairs, up the hillside. A long walk. Okay. And I being the person I am, I grew up in the mountains. <clears throat> if there's something that takes me upstairs to see a sight, I have to go do it. And here's a good uh, picture of the uh, lower stairs. The stairs get more narrow as you go up higher. And then there's another view of the length of the stairs as you go up and you see the platform up on the top, the viewing platform. 
And there's the top of the waterfall to prove we actually made it up to the top. And a beautiful rainbow. <clears throat> now we're back at the bottom. And of course, after you've been at the top, you got to go see the bottom. And uh, there I am in the mist, made it to the top and the bottom of this particular waterfall. It was great fun. Again, as Noah said, they're glacier fed. Then we're on our way to a folk museum, an open air museum, a technical museum, and the gift shop. Here's a uh, old Ford <clears throat> and go back to that one. And for people who like to enter the gift, uh, go to gift shops, here's the gift shop over here. I did that for my friend, Jenny. Um, we got to see a boat and hear about this fishing boat. And then these are askers, A-S-K-U-R, um, eating bowls. And they're made of driftwood because I told you the Vikings cut down a lot of the trees. So people would gather driftwood to make things. And these have a lid that flips up. And so the bottom was for your porridge or your soup. The lid would flip up to a flat surface for your bread, your meat, and your veggies. And then you have a spoon. And most of the spoons in the early days were made out of horn. This one looks kind of metallic. Um, and there's a sharp edge on the uh, back of the spoon for uh, cutting or you know, using it kind of as a fork. Now, this is interesting. They had fish scale shoes with knitted inserts. When you went on a trip, you figured out how many miles you could do in one pair of these fish scale shoes. And let's say you could do five miles before they wore out. So if you were doing a 15 mile walking trip, you had to bring three pair of shoes to make it to your destination. And if you're going back the same way, you actually had to bring six, one for each five miles because they'd wear out and you had to replace them. This is just one of the costumes in the museum. Very lovely museum. And this is the open air museum with the workhouses and the uh, living quarters. They're turf covered. This was the entrance to one of the little workshop houses. And then I'm going into a house and you can see it has low ceilings and a bedroom and then the, the, the bigger room where they ate, uh, they sat and they cooked. And this is a little church on the property. Very beautiful inside this little church. Now we're on our way um, to another area and this is a glacier we pass by. And they had a lot of bluebells, like in Scotland. We were in Scotland in May of the same year that we went to Iceland and Scotland was covered with these bluebells. A uh, couple of sheep, the sheep against the glacier. Now we're on our way and we've arrived to the glacial lagoon. And you can see the car coming across the bridge. So we are coming into the lagoon from this direction across the bridge and down into the parking lot. And I can't say that name, but it's a national park. And again, we have the sign with the safety rules. Don't step on the icebergs. Don't jump in the water. Um, you only survive a few minutes if you're in the water. No swimming, uh, don't unsafe surface, etc. <clears throat> so we're going out in a duck boat into the lagoon itself. And there's the boat going into the water. And this is a great shot because you can see the glacier here and then the various icebergs that have broken off and you can see that some are huge and you see dirt in some of the different uh, icebergs. Well, the glacier scours the land for those who aren't familiar with glaciers and drags dirt along with the ice and everything. Um, again, you can see we were against some pretty large glaciers. No, go back, please. And you can walk here around about half of that lagoon on this, um, again, kind of volcanic uh, pulverized soil um, so that you can see the glacier from land. And if you go in the duck boat, you can see the uh, lagoon from the water. Uh, this was a really huge uh, uh, iceberg uh, hiding the bridge. Again, just misshapen icebergs as they melt. And they're actually kayakers. And I don't think I'd want to kayak in this water because man, if you fell in, it would not be a pleasant experience. Uh, Noah saw a seal and there's the cute little head of the seal. 
And the uh, Arctic terns are courting. The male is going to offer this fish to the female and see if she's interested. And there's the happy tourist at the iceberg, uh, in front of an iceberg with a big hole in it at the iceberg lagoon. Here's a close up of that particular iceberg. Uh, keep in mind, this is July, August, and we're wearing layers. But it was very comfortable. It wasn't that cold. Just the ice. Uh, there was, yeah, you notice how we were bundled up. There was a bride who was sleeveless. <laughs> I hope she wasn't out there too long. Uh, there was a, a happy couple uh, looking at the uh, lagoon in their wedding attire. And for birders, snow bunting, the male snow bunting. We have painted buntings here in spring in Sun City, but snow buntings obviously in the colder areas. And then this is called Diamond Beach. This is where when the tide recedes, uh, icebergs are washed up onto the diamond beach. And when the sun is out, now it was a little overcast the day we were there, but when the sun is out, they look like sparkling diamonds. Oh, by the way, these photos are from our friend, uh, Dave Davis, these of the um, diamond beach. And again, you can see the clarity and the crystalline, crystalline um, surface of these icebergs. And there's a smaller one that Noah took, very clear, of course, because it's clear water. And then the tide started bringing some of these bigger um, icebergs out from the lagoon, and they're going out to sea. On our way back to Reykjavik, we stopped at the Volcanic uh, and Earthquake Museum. And this was quite interesting because it told you all about the volcanoes and talked about the different earthquakes. And you got to see different samples of you know, what the lava looked like. And one of the interesting things, of course, about Iceland compared to other volcanic areas is that they have volcanoes under their glaciers. So when the volcano explodes, you're getting a lot of water and mud. So that's a real danger if you live near one of these volcanic areas with glaciers. Our last activity on our tour was to go whale watching. We gave up the Blue Lagoon because we wanted to see the whales and more seabirds. And there's our boat. <clears throat> and so the whales we were going to see were the minke whales. We've seen orcas in Alaska. We've seen humpbacks in Alaska, humpbacks in Massachusetts. And now here was our chance to see the minke whale in Iceland. And there it is. <laughs> really exciting just to see the back and the fin. But we can say we saw minke whales. And that's a guillemot, another seabird that was out there that day. And the last thing we did on our own was go to the whale museum. And by the way, this is in Reykjavik. We're back into Reykjavik. And we saw the um, <clears throat> models of the uh, big whales. Uh, they had lots of different types of whales and uh, dolphins in this museum. Again, it's quite interesting. And that was the end of our tour. And if you have any questions, we'd be happy to take a few questions. So if anyone would like to unmute themselves and ask them questions, you're welcome to do that. Or you can put your question in the chat function too. If you hover at the bottom and see chat and click on it, then you can, that'll pop up on the right side of your screen and you can type your question there. So. Either also, way. Our, my email is down here. Uh, I'm the only Noah in Sun City. So if you just type right. it, Noah, you'll get to me. Uh, and we'd be happy to share what information we have. Uh, mm -hmm. Our plan is to go back to Iceland in June, hopefully, please God. And, uh, the, you know, everything works out. But it's a fant It's different than any other place we've been. It's absolutely amazing. Wonderful mm -hmm. people. They speak English, they're very friendly, food was good, accommodations were excellent, and it's just a marvelous place to visit. Okay, okay we have a couple questions in chat. Um, th the first one is, what interested you to choose Iceland as for, the, for your trip? Well, as I said in the beginning, um, a combination of things. We, we're outdoors people. We like to see some of the natural wonders of the earth. And so we were fascinated by the fact that there are a lot of volcanoes and glaciers in Iceland. As you know, the glaciers are melting on the earth. 
In fact, Iceland lost one of their big glaciers and, and they went up to the top of the mountain and put a plaque there to uh, signify that. And we're birders, excuse me. And we, as I said, we picked this particular trip because of the variety of activities. And one of the main things was we could go on that private cruise to see the puffins. Okay, another, mm -hmm. um, um, I'll combine two questions here. They would like to know um, how long your trip was. And also another um, individual has heard that Iceland is expensive and wonders what the typical restaurant and hotel prices were. Okay, the trip was <clears throat> nine days and seven nights. And the nine days, you know, the day you go there and the day you leave, we booked a day early to help us get over some of the jet lag and to see some things in Reykjavik on our own. For example, this tour did not stop at Settlement House to go in. Other tours might do that, but we, we stumbled upon it. We didn't do a lot of homework, to be honest, before we went, but it was right near our hotel. And um, I studied history in college, so I always like those kind of things. Um, what was the other part of that question? How expensive is it? Oh, yes, yeah. it is expensive. Um, on our tour, um, some of the meals were covered. Uh, breakfast was included at the hotel. And um, some dinners were included. And um, we ate at the pizza place a couple times for dinners because we didn't want to spend a lot of money. It was reasonable. We didn't want to spend a lot of time at a restaurant. We preferred to have more time to walk around and explore on our own. And um, when we were out uh, at some of these, um, like the Thingvellir uh, National Park, uh, they had a, a cafeteria. So you could go in and eat cafeteria food, which wasn't horribly expensive. And they do take uh, credit cards gleefully. We, let me put it this way. Some people might go out and want gourmet meals. Uh, we're not there to do gourmet meals. We're there to uh, have a decent meal, um, but also, as I said, to not spend a lot of time for us in a restaurant. We wanna be out looking at things. That's just our personal preference. Yeah, and keep in mind because of Iceland's uh, ge geography, everything is imported. So all their gasoline, all their fuel, uh, their food, a lot of that is imported. Oh, the other thing was we had a little grocery store right next to oh, the hotel. It was marvelous. So we would go in there and get some snacky things. Um, so, you know, that wasn't terribly expensive. The best licorice we've ever had. Yeah, they're big on licorice. They're, really, they're big on licorice in it Iceland. Was, it was wonderful. And we tried a couple of different brands and we found the one that was the best. So, um, yeah, we'd go into the grocery store and get the licorice. Uh, so we have quite a few other questions. Um, was climate change mentioned by any of your guides? Uh, yes, uh, they are losing their glacier. Actually, when the, it, the first glacier they lost, I think it was like two years ago or a year ago, and it was actually a national day of mourning because they realized they're going to lose their glaciers. And as I said, their waterfalls are all glacier fed. So when the glaciers go, so do the waterfalls. So if you're going to go to see this beautiful landscape and the waterfalls, you need to go soon. And that's another reason why we went to Iceland now. We wanted to see these things before they're gone. And we were supposed to go back to Iceland this summer to go to the northern coast because there's a couple other huge waterfalls up in the north we were interested in seeing. Plus, we wanted to see the northern coastline. But that was another reason we went when we did was to see some of these things before they're, they're no more. Um, another question. How long is the tourist season in Iceland? <laughs> well, it's actually year round because a lot of people go in the winter time to see the northern lights. But I warn you, it's flip a coin whether you're going to see them or not, because they have a lot of mist and cloudy days. So there are plenty of times when you don't see it. Oh, let me interject here. If you're going to go to Iceland, I would suggest you get on the computer and look at the average um, amount of precipitation mm -hmm. and the average temperatures for the season you plan to go. The reason I say that is we, we chose the dates we chose because I went and did that research and because of price, because the, the, uh, the dates we went for some reason were a hundred or $2 less than other dates 
uh, on either side of our dates, I don't know why. And um, we were just extremely lucky that we went when we did because it rained a little bit the first day we were there on our puffin tour. We had some days that were overcast, but we had some beautiful, incredibly sunny That's days. That seems big. And when I got home, uh, before I left, I got a haircut and I heard my hairdresser saying there was some other client who was going to go to Iceland also around the same season I was going in July. Well, when I got home and got my hair cut again, I hear I said, um, you know, I had beautiful weather. It was great, blah, blah, blah. And she said, well, the other client said it rained for the whole two weeks she was in Iceland. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just a crapshoot, obviously. But I always advise people to look at the precipitation and the temperatures uh, for when you're going, because that might help you get some better weather. Yeah, and the temperatures are like 50s, 60s. It's not okay. terribly cold. It's more oh. damp than anything. So when you were there, those were the temperatures, the 50s and 60s? Pretty much. Um, it varied because we so, had some, some unusually some, nice yeah, weather. Some days it was in the 70s. Yeah, some days were warmer. Um, I, I don't remember all the temps exactly, but you dress in layers. It is in the North Atlantic. So okay. it is in the cold. Okay. Um, another um, one of our uh, members said they recommend Down to Earth with Zach Efron on Netflix. It's an in it's in depth about the geothermal system and very interesting. Then another question was, um, what are you hoping to see on your next trip that you didn't see on the past one? Yeah. Our next trip to Iceland. Yes. Um. Well. I've read there's a couple of other big waterfalls that are different in nature than the ones we saw. Um, and then just to see the northern coast, there's some, uh, well, you took the cruise, Sherry. So, you know, there's some towns or villages or whatever you stopped at Formation. or city or whatever. Um, so we wanted to see those and how they were different from Reykjavik. Yeah, it's much less mm -hmm. visited. The, the Golden Circle uh, matter of fact, the government was, it was an article in the New York Times travel section. The, the government of uh, Iceland is really trying to move people off the Golden Circle because it is so well traveled. We were fortunate and on this trip, they did go off the circle. They did, they did the circle and then they moved off of it. Uh, the next trip is going to do a little bit of the Golden Circle, a couple of places we were not at. And then they're going to fly us across to the northern part where it's much less populated, more uh, rugged, and hopefully we'll see things we haven't seen before. Okay. Um, another member said that she went with the travel club in October on a Colette tour and did see the Northern Lights, but the puffins had migrated, so right. she did not see them. It's a puff the puffins are pelagic, which means most of their time is out at sea, but when it's time to breed, they come into various coastal areas. Iceland is one, Maine is another, and uh, Scotland. Scotland. Uh, so it's just, and they're just a fabulous bird to see. And I imagine that's the same with some of the other seabirds that the, the time that we went, you will see them because they're in breeding, but then as fall approaches, they go back out to sea. See. So if you want to see birds, I wouldn't go, personally, if I wanted to see birds, I wouldn't go in October. Yeah. So, and then another person asked to, to, uh, if you could say something about the mud baths that people do there in Iceland. <laughs> well, we gave up going to the Blue Lagoon because we were going to go, but then Noah said I'd, he'd rather go see the uh, whales and the seabirds. And so I wanted to be with them. So we gave up the Blue Lagoon. So I can't really talk about the mud baths, but you can go online and Google Blue Lagoon. It'll tell you about it. But from what I read, um, you get this gunk on you and it's hard to get like out of your hair. So you should, <laughs> no, really, this is what I read. You should wear a bathing mm -hmm. cap because it kind of sticks to your hair. So, but you can go online and check that out. Yeah, the Blue Lagoon is very luxurious. They have showers, changing rooms. They give you towels, bathrooms, and the water is a constant, whatever it is. But we were planning to do the Blue Lagoon if we get to do yeah. our second trip. Yeah, if we go back, uh, it isn't an option. It's part of the tour. This time we had an option of going on the Whale Watch or going to the Blue Lagoon. And we were outside the whole time we were on this trip. And I said, I really don't want to be inside in the Blue Lagoon. Let's do something a little bit more out. And our friends 
they were happy to do it too. So it was a great experience. The uh, whale watching was fun. We saw we saw gannets, northern gannets. We saw a lot of birds. It was really a beautiful trip. And um, another viewer or another uh, member apparently has been to the L L Blue Lagoon and said that it's absolutely awesome. Oh yes, all everyone on our trip who went there really enjoyed it. Felt it was just an amazing uh, facility. And you pass it on the way. The airport is quite a distance from Reykjavik, and you pass the Blue Lagoon. But on you only the way. see the steam. You yeah. don't see the Blue yeah. Lagoon. You see the steam. Yeah. You don't so, actually see the facility. And Lucy said that the water was very warm and relaxing. So. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> very, it has lots and lots of minerals. So it's supposed to be very healthy. Yes. So I don't see any other questions. So thank you so much for sharing with us today. This was a fascinating journey around um, Iceland, seeing all the different um, things that you saw. And so I hope that people have some ideas if you haven't been to Iceland and are wanting to go, some things that you might wanna see when you do go.